This episode is brought to you by WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. At WeatherGuard, we make lightning protection easy. If your wind turbines are due for maintenance or repairs, install our Strike Tape Retrofit LPS upgrade at the same time. A Strike Tape installation is the quick, easy solution that provides a dramatic, long lasting boost to the factory lightning protection system. Forward thinking wind site owners install Strike Tape today to increase uptime tomorrow. Learn more in the show notes of today's podcast. Welcome back. I'm Dan Blewett. I'm Alan Hall. And I'm Rosemary Bonds. And this is the Uptime Podcast, bringing you the latest in wind energy tech, news, and policy. All right, welcome back to the Uptime Wind Energy Podcast. I'm your co-host, Dan Blewett. On today's episode, we're going to talk about a recent battery fire um, from one of the Tesla mega packs uh, burned for about three straight days until it burned itself out in Victoria, Australia. So we'll talk about some of the implications and whether we should be concerned about battery technology as it takes off, whether that's going to be a problem for renewables. Uh, we'll also chat a little bit about the Block Island Wind Farm, which is five turbines up in New England. Four of them are currently offline and they've got some subsea cable issues that might need to be reburied. So we'll talk through some of the problems they're having there. We're also going to talk a little bit about the fishing sector, uh, sector get Rosemary's take here on uh, some new reporting from The Guardian about, you know, whether you, uh, the UK is sacrificing their fishing sector for offshore wind and whether this is really a zero sum game or if everyone can get along. We'll talk about some new technology in cranes, uh, the salamander lift system and what that means as Vestas invests in that technology. And lastly, kind of our big topic today, we'll talk about uh, thermoplastic blades, some interesting technology about how to bond them using uh, metal foils and whether this is going to be a sustainable practice, whether it'll work with lightning issues and all that, since we've got uh, two great minds on blades here. So before we get going, I want to remind you, you can sign up for Uptime Tech News in the show notes of today's podcast, no matter where you're listening on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, just click below and you can sign up for our weekly newsletter where we'll send you an update on the podcast and all of the latest news around the market. So. Let's get going. Um, Alan, I know you want to talk batteries. So this uh, big mega pack fire out in Australia sounds pretty scary. Um, what what was the uh, the story here with Tesla and this fire? Well, they don't have any details yet. And Rosemary may have a little more because she's a little closer to it than we are. But uh, they, it's a big lithium ion pack, battery packs out in uh, they were in construction mode, it sounded like, and they had an accident and a fire. They're not sure what caused it, but there's really nothing to do once the packs start to let go. They're going to burn until there's no more energy inside of them. So you just have to let it burn out, which is the 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 part that scares everybody is uh, because we're going to be having more and more battery packs and larger battery packs, uh, regardless of what the chemistry is inside of them. There's just still a lot of stored energy in there, and if they if they decide to let go. How are you going to stop it? And how are you going to mitigate it? How you, you know, there's population centers near there. How are you going to deal with that? Uh, so there's a lot of details that haven't been thought through on the, and at least in the United States, I can guarantee they haven't been thought through in the United States yet because we tend to have an accident and then write regulation after it, which Always is the worst thing you can do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the worst way to do it because then the engineers are out of it. Uh, it's just politicians <laughs> and lawyers discussing how they're going to save the planet, and there's no engineers at the table. Uh, so it, it, hopefully it's more of an impetus in, on the engineering side to think through those problems and try to, to mitigate them up front where we don't get into that rapid response congressional hearing situation. And, and, and Rosemary, have you heard anything more about the outcome of that fire? Have they announced any details? Uh, I just saw that the fire's out, so I guess that's an outcome. But no, I haven't heard any details. I am assuming that it's similar to any of the other lithium-ion battery fires that we've heard about in, in cars, but um, on a larger scale. So, 
Yeah, I uh, I think it's definitely the the worst aspect from my point of view is kind of the the PR for the you know clean energy transition as a whole. It's a really good weapon for um, opponents, political opponents to to raise now. Um, but I mean, fires in the batteries it's it's definitely a risk that engineers have been aware of and have been taking care to mitigate, you know, right throughout the history of lithium ion batteries. But I guess um, there's still some some way to go. I mean, can we ever get to the point of zero fires? That definitely, other technologies um, have never gotten to that point. We did see. In Victoria, um, back in 2014, there was a, a, a fire in a coal mine that burned for 45 days and um, probably killed um, about 11 people. So um, it's and of course, you see, you know, thousands of fires in um, petrol, gasoline cars every year as well. So I don't know if we'll ever be able to get to, get to the point where we have no fires, but definitely um, the different nature of the lithium ion fire where it's very hard to put it out once it gets started, that is going to require some different regulation. And I would hope that engineers could <laughs> could work together with the regulators <laughs> to, you know, get, get sensible proposals. Well, and you wonder, you know, with the way the world is today. So, you know, if you're a celebrity today, you are subject to incredible scrutiny that someone like you know elvis johnny cash like name a celebrity from the 50s and 60s and 70s never grew up with right like they didn't have to go through any of that um i'm not saying any of those people did anything worth noting i'm not gonna I'm not gonna go there there's just names but you know today with this new technology sprouting up in the world of instant news all over the web um you know oil and coal and natural gas didn't grow up in that same you know, they're essentially like the Elvises. They didn't grow up where if something happened at a coal plant or a petrol um, factory that it was going to suddenly be on Twitter and 80 million people were going to be retweeting it the same day. I mean, do you feel like that is just a just an unfortunate challenge of renewable energy? I think that's such a such a great analogy. And yeah, I guess lithium ion batteries are this, the celebrity of the energy, the clean energy transition. I had never thought of it mm -hmm. that way, but definitely going to be using that one in the future. Yeah, it just seems hard because again, it's like you almost can't have a slip up when and when these new technologies are coming out there, they're going to be and it doesn't seem like there's that many. But anytime it happens, it seems like it gets everywhere because this burned it burned for three days. But we've had cell phones that catch fire once in a while. And like you hear about it once in a while, like we know you can't have a laptop computer stowed underneath um, in the belly of the airplane. Is that that's right? Right, Alan? Like you have yes, to have it with you so true. in case something happens. But it you know, rarely ever happens. Is that right? It happens a lot less now because the industry made changes in the way they designed those batteries. So that didn't happen as often. But yeah, I mean, that that's the circular loop, right? You have on the airplane side, you had fires in the cabin and then you had congressional hearings and then you had the engineers trying to fix all the batteries. So they, that wasn't an issue. But there's occasionally it still does happen on cargo planes you hear, and cargo ships you hear about lithium battery fires. And there's really nothing to do about it. Like Rosemary said, there's... It's just going to burn itself out. Well, do we know that for for certain? I mean, if, if this is such a new thing still, and of course, like you both said, lithium is not that new, but do we know for sure that burning out is the only solution? I mean, in a year, I mean, is a company like Firetrace not on this, or maybe they can figure something out to extinguish, a, you know, I don't know, the oxygen or, or, or do something? Like, is there really, it, it strikes me as odd that there's really no solution except for letting it burn itself out. The lithium ion fires are bad in a sense because they provide their own fuel and and they provide so much massive heat that really all you can do is one try to cool them down and that's what is typically done like in a car test a car fire or electric car fire is so they throw water on it to try to keep the packs cool or to keep more packs from igniting and then they add the suppression foam to it to try to knock it down but the recent fires i've seen in automobiles it's pretty much let it burn until it stops. And I, I think until we either figure out a way to, to limit them some different kind of chemicals, which I'm afraid are going to be probably more caustic than letting the lithium ions burn, or change the chemistry so they don't do that, um, there's really not much we're going to be able to do about it. On airplanes, one of the things on airplanes when they use lithium ions batteries is they actually put it in a hardened case. So if there is a fire, they have to demonstrate that there is a fire in that in that lithium ion case that it doesn't escape that case 
And that's the way we deal with it on airplanes. It's not the most elegant way to deal with it, but it does work. And when you're talking about sort of general population things, you're not going to do that out in an open space because it's going to cost you so much money to do it. There's no reason to do it. And I think that's where you know we're going to see more effort on how to disconnect, maybe even physically separate the batteries. If one bank does go up, how do you pull the other ones away so they don't get so hot? Or how do you dump so much water on it that they don't, don't go up? That's going to be part of the trick. But the cost is going to get extremely high fast when you do systems like that. Well, it reminded me of fireworks um, companies, manufacturers. So if you are, well, I don't know why I know this, but if you go to a fireworks manufacturer, they have, it's almost like a campus where one thing is built in one little hut and then another cabin has another ingredient. So if any given building goes up, it's not going to destroy everything, which obviously it's so flammable. I assume they probably do that with other munitions too, but I know that's how they, how they operate, how they used to operate, especially back in the day when fireworks were, you know, originated in Japan and it was, you know, done in, in, in rural areas. They just kept everything as separate as they could so that if one thing went, not everything went. So moving on, let's talk about uh, this struggle, the struggles that the Block Island wind farm is having. So this is up in New England. They have five wind turbines. Apparently four of them are knocked offline at the moment. And there's also a high voltage power line that was buried uh, that is apparently coming back up and is going to need to be reburied at an expense of about $30 million. And it looks like uh, they're going to expect the taxpayers or the rate payers to help foot some of that bill at least. But this has been another, um, to your point, Rosemary, like any issue with any of these wind farms, the naysayers just want to jump on it. The, um, you know, the opponents of wind just want to jump on it. And to me, you know, they've said or said has said that, hey, this is just kind of routine maintenance. We're going to rebury the thing in the in the fall. It got pushed back. They want to allow tourism. Um, but Rosemary, does this sound like it's getting maybe a little bit blown? Obviously, this is not a good situation for the wind farm, but can wind farms go offline temporarily and not be, you know, suffering? It sounds like people are pushing a little bit of conspiracy here. Like, why are, why are these really <laughs> offline? Why are like, they shouldn't be down ever, but there is downtime and there is maintenance that needs to be done, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't know a lot about the details of this of this wind farm, but it's definitely true that there is downtime. Um, the article that I read said that four out of five of the wind turbines have been down for weeks, um, and that is not just normal downtime. So there's there is some issue at this wind farm, and um, whoever's got a final financial stake in the wind farm will be having a fit over this you know they will not not be at all impressed about this amount of downtime um so in that sense it's not normal however there are so many wind farms in the world now that some of them um have unusual problems you know if it's like a one in a hundred kind of thing then you know one percent of thousands of wind farms is still you know some <laughs> some discrete number of wind farms and I think that that's basically it. So, it's, yeah, it's like a combination of, no, it's not normal, but it's also not uncommon. Um, not so uncommon that we wouldn't see cases like this from time to time. Gotcha. And it sounds like there was maybe a little bit of an issue with just the way the approval process was done. So it says the, uh, the Coastal Resources Management Council um, typically recommends a burial depth of 8 to 10 feet for these, subs or for these cables. And this one was only buried at 4 feet. Um, and then within months, it says portions of the cable were exposed uh, to the shore. So, I mean, Alan, does it seem like maybe there are some oversight issues here that have maybe played into these problems? Yeah, well, if you're building a sandcastle over there, you're going to dig down at least three or four feet. <laughs> so I, I kind of wonder if that made a lot of sense. Block Island, if you've never been to Block Island, I haven't physically been to Block Island, but a lot of people around us go visit Block Island because it's off the coast of Rhode Island, and it's this nice little place out in the water, and all the you can hobnot out there, and it's it's a nice place to go visit. So visually, it's a lot of people see it, right? I think that's the bigger problem if that had happened off the coast of who cares and just pick nebraska you know some place where where no one's out there vacationing then it wouldn't have been a, such of a big deal 
but the, the issue on Block Island is there's just so many tourists there, and this is why they didn't want to upset anybody. They, they had to leave it because the tourism drives the economy on Block Island, and there's only a, a limited window where, where the weather's good enough to be out there. So you're going to get bludgeoned regardless what happens here. And maybe there's an oversight on how far down the cable was, or maybe the erosion's higher than they thought it was, or maybe there's a great white shark tugging on the cable or something, you know, who the hell knows. But the the the, the kicker is, is that, uh, as we talk about in wind all the time, the marketing departments and the PR departments sometimes don't do a really good job of getting out front of these things. They just let the press go on and never really provide any feedback and and. Or, or at least say, hey, it's a known issue. We're, we know we're going to take care of it, but we're also trying to help the economy at the same time. And we're going to have to wait because we need the hotels and the restaurants and the servers to make some money in the middle of COVID. Like, that's a better argument than I don't want to pay for it now. I'm going to wait till the fall. <laughs> that doesn't seem to play very well. So I, for whatever reason, the power industry does not, have great PR because it gets me. They feel like they don't need it. But as we we're talking about earlier, if if your if your battery bank goes up, then it's going to be on Twitter in the next thirty seconds, and that's bad. So maybe 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 a little more PR and a little less uh, obstinance about it would be better. Because you're right, Dan and Rosemary. The it's like instantaneous. The feedback on these problems is like instantaneous, and you get these explosive headlines like uh, "Wind turbines hazardous to humanity. We must pull them all down." Kind of emails and and uh, websites going, and it gets us. And on Facebook, it's it's the prevalent place to, to do that stuff. So it, it feeds itself and there's no limitation or pushback from the American Clean um, Clean Power Association or anybody to say, whoa, 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 let's all put a little perspective on this. And I think we do ourselves a great disservice when we let these problems escalate like they do. Well, and, and speaking of PR, uh, we wanted to get Rosemary's take on the fishing industry. So there's more and more articles coming out. You know, there's some here in the U.S., obviously, recently that we discussed. And now there's more on uh, talking about fishing in the U.K. So obviously, you know, someone's going to get pushed out a little bit, whether it's just not uh, unfettered access to any fishery they want. Uh, but anyway, this article from The Guardian, just the headline is UK is sacrificing fishing sector for offshore wind, wind farms says the fishing industry so rosemary i mean how do you what's your take on on the pr here and this sort of um conflict between fishermen and their livelihoods and the rapidly encroaching uh wind offshore yeah well i think it's a situation that's still it remains to be seen how much of a problem this is you know at the moment people are really worried that there might be a problem there aren't so many offshore wind farms currently that it's already causing a problem to anyone's livelihood and i know that in the uk they are trying at least to have um fishing able to happen quite close to um you know within wind farms and quite close to some of the individual turbines more more so compared to other countries like maybe germany is a bit more risk averse and doesn't want anyone going anywhere near these turbines so i think we do need to wait and see how much of a problem it's going to be but i mean i'm definitely sympathetic to anybody who's industry is um, potentially going to you know go away it's similar issues i guess with coal mining or any of those fossil fossil fuel jobs i do think that fishing is an industry that's going to be changing anyway you know it's been it's been done quite unsustainably over the you know last 100 or maybe more years so on the one hand i i kind of think you you see fish are actually protected in some ways by these structures being put there and preventing, you know, large predators and um, and fishing boats from going, you know, right up to them. So I think that, you know, there could be some benefits for fish. Um, there'll be some changes to fishing, but I don't know yet how extreme that will be. And I think, yeah, we're just going to have to see how it plays out to see how we need to regulate this. And um, I, I definitely wouldn't want to see the whole fishing industry collapse. But I also think that that's extremely unlikely it will it will be to that extent. Well, and it almost seems like, you know, the the wind turbines are part of that ecosystem. Like, you know, a little fish swims for cover. 
you know, under a rock or under some coral where a big predator can't get them. It almost seems like the wind turbines themselves do that same thing. Like the big predatory boat now can't swoop in and, and get the helpless little fish. But like you said, uh, maybe this is off, off air that, you know, it's, it's not clear whether or not these fish will stay in that same spot where they can't be accessed or if they'll just move and they'll still be, you'll still be able to fish, um, to an extent and they won't lose their livelihoods. Like you said, there's still just a, not a, not a lot of clarity, I think, on the issue um, and what the habits of Mother Nature are going to be, because it always seems to surprise us. I mean, there's so much out there with invasive species where scientists are like, oh, this new species has invaded this river. It's game over. And then five, 10 years, something happens that we could have never predicted. I mean, Alan, do you do you feel like we really know wh where this is going to end or is this just sort of a sort of just a, a panic switch kind of? thing at the moment it's too early to tell and i think dan i heard some really interesting things in the wind turbine sector this week on another podcast talking about wind turbines in 2050 and i thought that is the most ridiculous damn thing i've heard this week and that, i've heard a lot of ridiculous things this week but any prediction of something that's going to happen 30 years out is nuts in wind turbine you just can't you can't tell I will be the, a cyborg. We this is that's my prediction. <laughs> yeah, I'll be in a car it's accident like, in twenty. What years of twenty twenty? I'll be in a car accident in twenty forty two, and then I will return as a cyborg. So look well, forward to that. that. That's just it. Like, how do how do we know what's going to happen with fishing? And when we haven't really started with it, and obviously we're not going to be uh, putting wind turbines out in the ocean so fast that we can't monitor it. Like, come on, there's going to be feedback loops here and all this stuff, and we're going to be able to adapt. And you know, just like with the bird losses in particularly the United States of birds running near wind turbines and uh, getting hurt, uh, that there's going to be a lot of environmental oversight in this. In the United States, they're just not going to let this get out of hand. And the, and the fishing uh, groups have large sway, particularly in Massachusetts and the other uh, coastal communities. So it's not going to get out of hand before there's a feedback loop. And, and uh, as we said before, there's really not a slippery slope here. Let's just take one day at a time and, and just be careful. All right. So moving on, uh, Vestas has a you know investment arm of their company, just like all these other big companies do to help push you know innovation along, especially if it could help them. So Vestas Ventures, um, was created in November of 2020. And one of the new companies they're uh, investing in is SNL Access Systems, which is a, a I guess, subsidiary is the right word of Stina. Um, and this is an interesting new crane technology. It's basically a, a climbing crane. So if you've seen these self-building cranes all over cities, all over the world, where they have this sort of lattice work and, and they actually build themselves up, they call it climbing by inserting one segment, the, tr the crane jacks itself up, inserts another segment until it gets to the height that it needs to be. Um, so it looks like this system is called the Salamander Quick Lift, um, essentially sort of attaches itself to the base of a wind turbine tower, and then it will climb, build itself higher and higher, and then sort of shimmy itself up for stability. Um, and this is something Vestas is pretty excited about in their, pr in their press release. So uh, Rosemary, Obviously, with your work on uh, winter and blades with LM, um, it seems like maybe crane technology is something that's lagged behind. I mean, how do you feel like, is this something that the industry is needed? Yeah, I think that they do need new solutions. And um, actually, it's been interesting coming back to Australia. People are talking about cranes all the time here in a way that they weren't in Europe. There's maybe not as many cranes of the right size as you would need to, you know, install a, a wind farm or to, you know, pull a gearbox out of a, um, an nacelle. So I, I think that, uh, yeah, technology development within cranes is really good. I've seen a, a few interesting things over the years, interesting ideas either to do with cranes or ways that you don't need to have such a large crane, you know, like building towers from the bottom up, um, uh, which, I don't know, it feels a little bit like this in that, yeah, it's kind of hauling itself up as it as it goes. So it looks interesting to me. I haven't seen enough detail on the design. Um, and yeah, it would be so cool to, to see a video of it actually operating. 
Um, so I can't really comment on how likely this particular technology is to, you know, really shake things up, but it would be really good to have a, a crane or well, more cranes for a start and ones that are easier to get to remote sites that, I mean, that would be really fantastic to see a big development there. So I think it's uh, definitely got potential. Rosemary, do you see the uh, uniqueness of the Vestas Ventures group in that they're actually creating a pocket of money, set aside a pocket of money to invest in newer companies, newer technologies. That seems different than what I have seen from the wind turbine industry generally. Like GE hasn't really done that sort of thing. They've let uh, the U.S. government sort of take that role. And in, in Europe, it seems a little odd that that's the way it's set up. Boeing just recently divested of a group just like that. That was an investment in new technology, and they offloaded that and because they couldn't manage it. But is that the future? Is Vestas just realizing that there's so much technology out there that they can't really develop it all in-house and that they're just going to have to buy it at some point or pour money into it so they don't, as a company, have to, to develop all the infrastructure for it? Yeah, I'm not sure. It seems uh, it's really not my area, um, the you know the, the structure of, of companies, but it does seem like a little bit cyclical, you know, that people buy up a lot of technology companies and then they sell a bunch of <laughs> technology companies and it kind of it goes in and out of favor whether that's the right way to do it. A company like GE is a, a good contrast, or probably Siemens as well, where they, um, you know, they're these huge conglomerates. They've got, they've got their fingers in many pies throughout the the group. So maybe they're less um, interested in bringing on more, um, yeah, more technologies, more companies um, in totally different areas because they've already got so much covered within. You know, like within GE, it's so broad that there's a lot of um, expertise on, you know, I don't know if they've got any crane expertise, but within their power industry or, you know, anything else, they might already have a technology that they can um, bring in and use. And that would be their preference. Um, yeah, so I don't know if, if that's the, the smartest investment thing or if they would rather do partnerships. That's what I've been more involved in is, you know, you, you stay separate, but you work together closely on something you intend um, you intend to maintain that, you know, um, customer supplier relationship, but just work closely on the development so that it works out in the way that, you know, suits suits the customer well. So let, let's, let's walk down this pathway just for a quick moment, because I, I want to hear your thoughts about this. So let's just, in theory, say there's a company named Ping, and that there, there was a CEO named Matt that ran Ping, and they've got this really great sensor device they're putting on a lot of wind turbines right now, and they have developed all the technology, which seems like every wind turbine should have something like that. If you're Vestas or if you're uh, GE, doesn't it doesn't it make sense to like say, hey Matt, uh, have a nice time in Tahiti. Here's here's a pile of cash, and we love your we love your product, and and we want to make it into re we want to just explode it, which is something that Matt may may not be able to do, and uh, in the middle of COVID, and on top of it. It, doesn't that make a lot more sense than just ignoring that technology? Because that seems like where the industry's headed a lot of times. So like there's some really great uh, robotic technology out there. There's a really great sensor technology. All these smaller companies are starting to congregate around the wind industry. But the wind OEMs seem to, for the most part, just to ignore it and miss the opportunities when they could buy a ping-like company, let's just throw it out for 50 million bucks, that five years from now, they're going to buy for 250 million bucks. So do, doesn't, when does wind realize that it's it's a technology? When does it, when does it get to that point? Is it soon? Well, I think, um, I think, I agree with you that ping is a is a cool technology and I'm surprised that more of the OEMs aren't really interested in it because I know that um, if you're developing a technology outside of the industry, it's really hard to get the access that you need to test it and develop quickly. So I, um, I would love to see more partnerships there. But I can also talk from the uh, other point of view of working at a major OEM with people constantly, you know, every week, several people um, telling me, hey, I've got this idea that's going to, you know, revolutionize 
uh, everything and the technology might be, I mean, it's very hard to tell how developed a technology is from somebody's <laughs> little um, PowerPoint presentation that they um, send you through, you know, it could just yeah. be a, a, a sketch and it could be something that's ready. But when I was in a role like that, I, I had way too many of these things like just bombarding me, um, it, you know, really? every, every week okay. if I didn't screen for them. Yeah. And um, the vast majority of them will never go anywhere. Um, so you do start to see patterns of the same type of thing. Like when I was working with um, de-icing systems, you know, there's no shortage of people that have what they say is an ice phobic coating. So you just paint, right. paint a blade in this stuff. The ice will never stick to it to it and they're like why isn't anybody why isn't everyone jumping all over themselves to um to buy this technology from me it will solve all your problems and from my point of view it's like i i have no belief that your technology is going to work not because i know anything about you or how good your technology is but simply because i've seen 20 other people who have made similar claims of course we all want um you know a, a paint that you can put on a blade that means you don't need to install an expensive heating system um that's not that's not in doubt but um, I just didn't have the, the time to go through every single innovation when um, very quickly I became totally cynical about any of them ever working. So uh, because, you know, I just seen so many that that yeah. did did not live up to what they they said. So I suspect that that's the main thing. Yeah. Is there a diff is there a difference here? Let me let me step through the difference because I want to. Re this is a fascinating place for me because we're in that mode, right? My my little company's in that mode. So the 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 issue is there's a difference between the ideas that I get, and so people submit ideas to me like, "Hey, I know how to maximize the the amount of wind in an acre." And you're like, "Great, call GE. <laughs> I can help you." But there's a lot of more companies coming, getting that five year ten mark, which is that sweet spot in wind where you've been around long enough that people know who you are and they can go back and look at the data and see, yeah, okay, this is real. This is not real. From a, did you ever get that type of feedback? If you're sitting at LM working away on de-icing blades, did you ever have somebody come to you like, we've been doing this for five years and it works. Here's the data. Boom. Yeah. And those are the ones that I would pay serious attention to. If, um, you know, like I, I would never really give much attention to an idea unless it was an idea that I had never had before and clearly, you know, had potential, um, which never happened actually. <laughs> so really, it would, yeah, I, it's Why? most things have been thought of. There's, there's at <laughs> least tens of thousands of, of engineers working for decades in the wind industry. Yeah. You know, a lot of people th yeah. think that, um, you know, like if you ask someone, why does wind turbine have three blades? I think like read comments on that on, on YouTube. And most people think <laughs> yeah. it's because engineers are so close minded and never think to do anything other than what everybody else has been doing. Um, but that's, that's not the kind of person that becomes an engineer. The kind of person that becomes an engineer is because they're always trying to make things better and think, Oh, what about if we did it like this or like this? And a lot of times the reason why we haven't adopted a technology that sounds like a good idea is simply because of the, like the inertia in the whole manufacturing um, system. Mm -hmm. you, you wouldn't even, I think you could easily make a two-bladed wind turbine that was just as good as a three-bladed one, but it requires changing so much, making so many um, problems um, that you need to fix, and it would end up being about as good as uh, a three-bladed one. Why would you bother? I think that is, that's probably the main reason why any individual great idea hasn't been implemented because they don't see a big enough benefit to warrant all the pain. Um, but yeah, when it comes to technologies like, like ping or like this crane, you know, that's different because it's solving a, a real problem that people acknowledge as a problem and don't have a solution for yet. And they've demonstrated that it works beyond an idea. So I guess that would be my advice for anyone with a great idea for wind industry or probably any other industry is you need to show why, why you're solving a real problem and demonstrate that your solution is actually going to, you know, going to work, going to be manufacturable, going to be scalable, going to be cost effective. That's the thing that, that most people fail on, especially if you're bringing solutions from the aero industry over to the wind industry. That's all. That's always the, the number one hurdle. Um, yeah. So I, um, I think it's really 
tricky because there will be real good ideas out there that get lost in this kind of cynical screening of I'm not interested because you haven't proven it because how can you prove it if you can't get in a, a wind turbine? So, right. I, yeah, I think you need to get really creative and do as much as you can um, on your own. And then I do – I would like to see more partnerships with um, – with the manufacturers and I've been surprised sometimes when I work with technologies that I think are great and uh, demonstrated, I've been surprised how hard it is to get it in an actual wind turbine. There's a lot of people involved, you know, from the manufacturing, um, then, you know, so if it's a blade technology, you have to deal with the blade manufacturer, the turbine manufacturer, then with the customer as well um, and the operator and everyone has to be on board for the extra effort versus the benefit for them, you know, it's not enough that you're going to save the manufacturer some pain or some money if it's the operator that has to do all the extra work, you know. So right, right. Well, that 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 is a good segue into the thermoplastic blades. So I think this is a really interesting technology that's been going on the last couple of years, where uh, there's been some releases uh, in the last week or so from. U.S. Uh, government agencies talking about making thermoplastic blades and incorporating them into wind turbine designs. And my first question about that is, like you were saying, why? Is it a 10x multiplier? Is it 10x times cost savings or manufacturing time savings? Is, is it that much of a delta on thermoplastics in terms of new technology? that it would it be worth implementing what is the rationale for making some of these changes and what impediments like you got to put something in the blade to heat it so you can thermoplastically build a blade are those impediments so large it doesn't even make sense to go down the pathway yeah it's actually when you um mentioned you wanted to talk about this week um this topic this week i remembered a thermoplastic blade design that i cited in my phd thesis so i actually went back and had a look at <laughs> a look at that which is pretty funny um, found the papers from 2011 and that was a really interesting design just through the the structural design method that they used um and in that paper they also cite thermoplastic blade design efforts going back as far as 1996 so so it's not new that we wanted to make a thermoplastic blade. And um, the benefits, are, I mean, the number one benefit in my mind is the recyclability um, and it should also make repairs and stuff easier. Um, the manufacturing stuff, they always, every article about it says how easy it will be to manufacture, but I think that there's as many problems as benefits in the manufacturing the real thing that's kept us from doing it is the structural pr properties. Most thermoplastics are not nearly as stiff as a thermoset um, a thermoset resin. So that's why we haven't seen them up until now. Um, and I guess this new, they, they've, they've got a specific, because, you know, it's not like every thermoset is um, as strong and stiff as another and every thermoplastic is the same. It's not like these two separate separate groups there is overlap and presumably they have finally after you know lots of tweaking found a thermoplastic that is stiffer than than the older older ones because i can't see how they could make a, a decent blade design um until that's the, oh, yeah, the right. case yeah right so the technology is from Arkema and it the 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 product is called Elium and it's a two part mix and it, it it would be basically using the same processes we use for thermosets today, where we we lay up all the fiber uh, for the blade and we inject uh, the resin polyester or epoxy resin in, into the tool and let it kick off and cure. In this particular case, instead of making a thermal set, which is a a, a a chemical cross linking that happens in, in, in like an epoxy where it just becomes toughened because of the of the links that are there. This our our chemo pro project and the the pathway they're going down is a, it makes a plastic. So you inject these two pieces. It makes a basically a, an MMA methyl methacrylate uh, plastic uh, blade. And then the MMA adhe adhesives are relatively tough. We use them in a lot of aerospace applications because how tough they are. So the technology is interesting, but like you were saying, is is and it, it allows you to then 
heat weld or, or, or fusion weld bits together instead of epoxying two parts together you could actually fusion weld them and make it into one continuous piece but is it the follow-on uh parts uh, like in the factory it's pretty easy because it's controlled but what happens out in the field where i got to replace part of a blade is it is everything changed all the training changed for all the technicians does all the tooling change because i got to get this part hot to bond new materials onto it what what's stopping this technology because what we're seeing on at least in the united states is a big push for the recyclability which is in our case 20 odd years down the line and america's not good at looking 20 years down the line does that 20 year end of life benefit overcome all the things that happen for the 20 years of service life how does that how do you weigh those things yeah i think it will be a it will be a huge change before we see a whole blade made out of thermoplastic because you're going to have to um well the whole structure will be need to be redesigned and then you know you have all the problems of um yeah just a brand new product that hasn't had that evolution that um you know the epoxy or whatever other material manufacturers are using you know they've got a long history they know exactly how they they last over time and um we don't we don't know that it's only so far you can get with um coupon tests and subcomponent tests to really figure out the fine details of how a structure is going to behave over um 20 or 30 years but um, I think there's a, there's a lot of potential, and it should eventually make all these things easier because you can, you know, because you can weld it, you can you can melt a thermoplastic, and you can't melt a, a thermoset. That's the that's the big difference. And the way that I usually describe it is that a thermo thermoset is um, it sets like when you fry an egg. You know, you can't you can't melt an egg after you've fried it because you. <laughs> The, the polymers, the long chains, they, they make these cross links and they're just like they're, they're joined together now and that's, that's it. You can only burn it. You can't, you can't melt it. But a thermoplastic is more like, um, you know, when you cook spaghetti and then you let it set, um, you know, it'll, it'll be one solid thing, but all the individual strands of spaghetti are still individual strands. And if you were to, you know, put that in water again, you could separate the, the strands out. So that, that should be really, really good for repairs because you'd be able to you know melt the bond line take out whatever faulty component just swap it back in with a brand new one and have it be exactly the same as it was so it should be better but it's totally new it's brand new it's not we're not going to be seeing full thermoplastic blades um even if the material properties are exactly the same it's going to be a decade uh, at least before uh, i that's um maybe I shouldn't make such bold predictions, but I don't think we'll see a full thermoplastic blade within a decade. What I do think we'll see is small parts of the blade start to be made in thermoplastic. So maybe we'll see just the tip of the blade made with thermoplastic, just the leading edge, just the web, you know, some something. Um, because you can still glue them. You don't have to weld them. Right. Um, True. So this article was mostly about that welding process and leaving the conductive strip in there and the lightning implications um which is a whole other huge um topic i don't know if you want to talk about that yeah well uh, i I think we're going to save that for next week but i do because i I really want to delve into that uh because the the lightning laboratory that's uh near our facility ran those tests and it was interesting to hear their thoughts on it but uh, in terms of just the technology in general and is one of the one of the pieces that was promoted when I was doing research on this was how fast that the thermoplastic actually sets up. So it sets up in a, a matter of say an hour versus a thermal set, which can take up to twenty four hours to fully cure. Now I, I learned recently that uh, when Henry Ford was making the the Model Ts or Model As, wherever the car was, is that they painted them all black, and you said get it any color you want. It just has to be black. And the reason they chose black because the paint dried faster in black than other colors did so it actually increased the production like if you can bang out a couple more cars an hour that means more revenue for the company but is wind turbines are we up to that kind of speed where we need to put a part in a mold and bang it out in an hour are we ever does that even make any sense as a as a multiplier effect for thermoplastics yeah definitely i mean i i am i was a bit surprised when i saw that that was one of the main benefits that they saw in this and the article i read it also didn't fully understand the existing technology because you 
it said that you know you'll get away from needing to heat the molds to cure the resins, and you don't. That not every thermoset no, needs don't. to be heated to cure. Um, I mean, everybody's used a two-part epoxy from the hardware store, right? Like, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's not complicated. <laughs> Um, but th- throughput is hugely important in a wind turbine factory because, you know, you've got the molds there taking up space and, um, yeah, while a blade is sitting in the mold, you can't start the next one, right? So anything that you can do to, to speed up the time between, you know, starting to use the mold and when the blade can be taken out of it, that, that makes a big difference if you can um, – and curing time is a big, 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 big consideration as well. So, yeah, definitely that's that's an issue people want to solve. So maybe maybe that just that, that part alone is being able to maybe – build less tooling, maybe use less floor space and produce the same number or even greater quantities of blades. Maybe the the impetus to really take it on rather than the recycling bit, which is 20 years down the line. That's that's a really interesting thought. They also say that you could um, you know, build them up from modular pieces. So you wouldn't maybe not even need to use a full length mold in the factory. Maybe you would ship a, a IKEA kit out to a wind farm and they would you know assemble it on site. So, uh, Ikea, you know, the gold standard of durability. <laughs> if you want your things to last 20 years, yeah. call Ikea. Call mm-hmm. Ikea. Yeah. But point, so that's, point taken. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a more out there idea. But, you know, I, I think that with plastics, it is one of those things. People have been thinking about it for, what did I say, 96 was the first one that I could find. So a long time. And it is one of those things that's like – um, gets engineers excited because it's like, oh, it would remove this constraint. Oh, it would remove this constraint. And so it is kind of, yeah, like really, um, a really fun technology for engineering nerds to, <laughs> to think about. <laughs> well, when you see an idea has such persistence, is that sort of lend some credence that like, hey, this is probably going to work at some point? Because like you said, if it's stuck around for 25 years and now it's starting to become a little more feasible. I mean, is that... Is that a sign that it has some viability or, or not, maybe not so much? I tend to think the opposite when I hear the same idea over and over and over again. I'm like, oh, God, that thing, that thing again. Like, no, it's, <laughs> there's, there's always some some reason. Um, I don't think that about thermoplastics. I think that it is inevitable that we eventually get to them. Um, it's been quite hard, probably harder than the people writing that 1996 paper um, imagined. But yeah. yeah, I I think we'll get yeah. there. Well, I I think the trouble here's here's my two cents on that because I think we aim too high with technology. And the Arkema website was really fascinating because it said that the probable uses for this great new material and it is I have to admit it's fantastic. It's it's really cool technology. Is wind turbine blades and airplane fuselages. And my first response is like there is no freaking way you would choose those as your initial. Uh, uh, products because the downside risk is so damn enormous. Why would you do that? If an airplane falls out of the sky, your company is gone. Gone. And if a wind turbine blades start breaking, your company is going to be severely impacted financially. How about making something that is less critical out of the thermoplastic that uh, that just gets the acceptance in the engineering community, right? If you made little light airplanes out of the stuff uh, and, and let the industry grow for five, 10 years, then there's a payday. And the same thing in wind, if you've made smaller wind turbines with it and uh, say you're making 500 kilowatt machines or something, so that, that you're, you're downplaying the risk, but also demonstrating the technology, then it gets a little easier to swallow when you're ready to go prime time. But it seems like the marketing departments grab hold of these things and go, we're going to launch a man into space uses this new technology and, and all this engineers just go, there is no freaking way I'm ever listening to anything that's coming out of you because that that's that's not rational. Not that I don't want to put a man on the moon, I do, but that's not rational. We need to take a couple of slower steps at it. And this is where I think Rosemary's right. Like you start seeing the technology over and over again because they're shooting so high. Aim a little lower, start making money, show that it is going to stick around a little while and then start knocking on the doors of Airbus and Boeing and Siemens and LM and then really go for it. I think that that's the better pathway that I, I have seen. And, you know, everybody has their own opinion about it, but that's that's what I've seen has worked. Well, and the, the fellows from Orbital Composites who we had on the show oh, yeah. a couple months ago, you know, their dream is to 3D print blades out of thermoplastic. And this yep. is something we've discussed on the show, which is that everyone's only thinking 
you know, GE Halliate X size and Siemens <laughs> SG fourteen seven seven dash nine. You know, you know the <laughs> lovely serial numbers. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah. as we kind of chat through with them, the small wind market might be a really good market for them to start. Where now you're talking right. about a 15 meter blade or whatever size. And right. then, like you both said, that that could be a place where you prove that technology out. And someone says, hey, these have done really well, you know, in this sector on people's farms producing, you know, 40 kilowatts or whatever. Um, maybe it's as this is advanced, maybe it's time to give it a, a shot, a little bigger one, you know. And and the other thing exactly. they discussed was the um, the forgotten blade market. I mean, how many older models are not going to have an OEM manufacturing new blades for anymore? I mean, Rosemary is that's going to be a, a big problem, isn't it? That these some of these old two megawatt machines, no one really cares about them anymore because just replace them anyway. But there's probably some small townships and little little towns all over the world that. They want a, a new blade for their old turbine. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. And maybe even, especially for the even smaller ones, I have seen some, um, yeah, some companies that that's their that's their little niches that they're making blades for. I even I saw one, um, an old LM wind. Oh, it wasn't even LM wind power. It was an LM glass fiber or glass fiber. W- whatever yeah. it was before that when they were making furniture. I saw these old drawings um, <laughs> attached to a totally different manufacturer who have, yeah, found this market of recreating these very old blades that are, yeah, like five meters long or, or less even. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it, it's, I think it's those really small size because when you get up into megawatts, then it's much more just like a cost benefit thing overall for a, a whole fleet and, We'll see some repowering, but in general, I think the whole wind turbine is um, going to be retired and replaced with something larger once the once it reaches the end of its life. Well, hopefully, it gets its foothold somewhere. And, and like Alan said, we'll probably chat next week about some of the uh, lightning implications and other things there because that enters a whole new, you know, slew of potential issues, which is what we know about. You know, these uh, glass fiber blades might not apply to thermoplastic and the whole game might change as far as like you said heating or lightning protection or any of these other peripheral systems we might have to sort of start from you know the ground level as how to protect these blades or what protection they might need hopefully it's less but we're only going to figure that out from uh real world real world testing right so Well, that's going to do it for today's episode of the Uptime Podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Again, be sure to subscribe to Uptime Tech News. You'll find the links in the show notes no matter where you're listening. Also, be sure to follow WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. You'll find links there. Be sure to follow Rosemary Barnes' awesome YouTube channel where she's explaining tons of renewable energy uh, topics. Definitely check her out. You'll find links to subscribe to her channel as well in the show notes. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you here next week on the Uptime Podcast. Operating a profitable wind farm is all about mitigating costs, minimizing risks, and being efficient with maintenance, repairs, and upgrades. It's incredibly expensive to send a team of rope access technicians up tower to make even simple repairs. We also know how costly lightning damage can be, requiring inspection, repairs, and downtime for even minor lightning strikes. Maximize the time efficiency of your techs and prevent future lightning damage by installing our Strike Tape LPS upgrade the next time your crews are going up on ropes. Learn more in today's show notes or visit us on the web at weatherguardwind.com.